All right. A um, couple things. Um, I'm going to try to get a little more informed on it next week, but just be in prayer and if maybe take a moment and look up uh, one of the laws that's trying to get passed in California right now concerning the ability to counsel according to the Bible. Um, there's uh, some pretty, pretty significant attempt to, to um, really put a lid on, on biblical counsel and, and instruction. But uh, hopefully have a little more on that for you next week. But if you get time, kind of check that out, especially concerning things about homosexuality and transgender and being able to accurately tell them what the Word of God says. And the, it seems that the state of California is trying to make that illegal. Um, but I don't have the exact details, and there's a little bit of conflicting information that I came across, so I want to try to get um, as accurate as I can on that. But be in prayer either way for the state of California, because we know that whether you live in Washington, Oregon, or California, what, what crazy thing passes in one soon infects the others. <laughs> uh, seems to be how we like it on the West, West Coast. But also, um, you know, John kind of brought it up uh, at the beginning, uh, enjoyably with, with, uh, with getting his phone call. <laughs> but that's something, um, you know, we want to continually remind ourselves to sharpen ourselves about, um, not just concerning having our cell phones off during the service, but also if we have needs like getting up and moving out of the service, or we have children that will need to be taken out or something during the, during the service, first off, we love you and we want you here. Not a problem. But we want to think about those around us and probably sit appropriately according to your needs to be the least distracting as possible. So it really doesn't bother me. I've been in some crazy circumstances now to teach and all sorts of weird events and mission field and so on and so forth, and I'll, I'll survive. But this is a time that as a body of believers, we set aside specifically for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we love Him... We know that we will love others, and we become others-orientated. And so when we come here both um, in our attempt, in our families, and crazy life to get here on time so that we don't distract during the worship, or our phones, or our conversations, or our need for the bathroom, um, that we have these things in mind um, for the service time, because not just for our own worship, but for the worship of, of the child of God next to you. So we want to try to make this a, a, that special time and, and work towards, towards doing that. So we'll be in Luke chapter 21 this morning. Luke 21. Kind of continuing on there and some, uh, some unpopular scripture. 80% um, of the church no longer teaches on the subject. We've talked about that. I uh, recently got to go down at the beginning of this week and share with some friends of mine that uh, I got to disciple in the Lord, um, a group of Romanians down in Phoenix, Arizona. And I shared on a number of things of why I believe uh, that this is an hour, a time in human history that is absolutely unique to any point in human history, and that it's all pointing to the coming of the Lord. And many of them really kind of shared, you know, well, that's really not a message that would draw people to Christ. And one of them, you know, kind of, well, you know, I know some, some good scholars who are amillennials and have some, some different points of view. Um, but I really feel that as we have as a body over the last six months, we've taken a little extra time and emphasis to talk about the coming of the Lord in the last days. And we'll really kind of continue to do so this year. And the Lord will give us kind of a fresh focus for next year. But we're going to really kind of focus in on that a lot this year. In fact, we'll even bless with the opportunity to have um, a gentleman named Eric Barger, who uh, co-hosts with Jan Markell on Understanding the Times. They're going to be here to put on a weekend conference in October to really kind of put a capstone on, on where we are and what's going on in the world. Um, it's just something that's really... As the world has been, as the church has been straying away from the subject, we wanted to make sure that we weren't country bumpkins when it comes time um, to see these things come to pass. So, so I kind of split this chapter in half, and we've been dealing with some of the things, and, and we'll uh, continue to do so today. 
But Jesus gives us some historical signs so that we would know about things that would happen in the future. So that it would be obvious to us. One day a diver was enjoying an aquatic world 20 feet below sea level. He noticed a guy at the same depth as he was, but he had no scuba gear whatsoever. So the diver went below another 20 feet, but the guy joined him a few minutes later. And the diver went below still another 25 feet, but soon the same guy joined him. Confused, the diver, so he, he took a waterproof chalk and a board set and wrote, how on earth can you stay under this deep without equipment? The guy took the board and chalk, erased it, erased what the diver had written and wrote, I'm drowning, you dummy. <laughs> so there, there are times in life when things are obvious that we should get and we should know. And so Jesus sets up the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple as a historical indicator for us to understand what did happen and so that we would also understand a little bit about what will happen. Um, God has done this in several places in Scripture where he has an initial fulfillment that casts kind of a, a shadow, if you will, of things to come. So you'll know what, they'll, what they will look like. But the substance is still not yet there. And we'll be dealing with that today as we go through verse 20 to the end of the chapter of, of Luke 21. Um, it's kind of uh, exciting, exciting stuff. This first section, these first few verses, 20 through 24, really is kind of unique to Luke. Matthew and Mark really dive in to the abomination of desolation. They really focus on the center of the set last seven-year tribulation period. Um, when speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem, they take that historical event and they put it, um, they, they put the prophetic in context of what happened historically so that we would have an idea of what was going on. But Luke really doesn't do that, and I think that there's kind of a method to his madness. Luke, as we've talked about since the beginning of the book, writes very specifically to the Gentiles as where Matthew and Mark really have much more of a Jewish flavor. They'll talk much more in this section about the end times, about the temple and the Sabbath and things that will come concerning the Jewish nation. But Luke, he kind of gives us that quick overview of not only what it would be like for them leading up to 70 AD, but also the, the time gap in between his first and second coming there in verses 10 through 19. And now he's going to revisit, he's talked about this a couple times, the destruction of Jerusalem. And we know historically that this book, Jesus' words were recorded before the fact. That, that historically we know that he spoke them beforehand, that people were aware of them and knew them. And that there was a great time of distress leading up to it. And so, as we begin to see these things unfold, we should take encouragement not only that, that when you have a series of things lining up and happening exactly as he said they would, that the things that, per, that follow them will also happen exactly as he said they would. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. So he starts off, and he reminds them of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. You know, when, when they were talking about the temple, and when he was even entering in Jerusalem, Jesus wept so much that it seems that he, was con he convulsed. It was this bitter weeping over this city that was going to reject him. And because of that, great destruction would come upon the city. And the temple, as beautiful and magnificent as it was, as we talked about last week, not even one stone would stand upon another. In fact, they still are trying to find the exact place where to start to rebuild it because they did such a good job of obeying what Jesus said would come to pass. But 
Jesus here gives this warning. And the Christians would heed it. Many of the Jews thought that if, that if we see Jerusalem surrounded by the Gentiles, the Messiah is going to come. They kind of had this buzz going a little bit for a while now. We know from Josephus' writings that when Rome removed their ability to execute capital punishment, that um, their ability to really have authority to govern over themselves, that there was a little bit of a buzz because um, many interpreted the, the Bible to mean that that, that rod or that, that ability to, to rule over yourself wouldn't be removed from Judah until Shiloh comes. And so when that happened, they said, okay, Messiah must be near. And in fact, he was. But they also believed because this was such a special city to God that God wouldn't let it fall, that it wouldn't be destroyed. Messiah would come first. He was going to restore Israel just like they kept wanting Jesus to do. Let's, let's, make this, let's make this bad boy a nation, and let's take over Rome. And so, as the city began to be encircled by Titus and Rome, this would have still been in 69 AD when they began to do this, um, many Jews began to actually go to the city and go to the temple because Messiah was going to come, or they were a part of this whole zealot revolution. They were going to help defend the holy city. And so they fled to it and they, they um, packed it in there. But Jesus gave a warning. He said, when you see this, run. And there are some 3rd century, excuse me, 4th century, so in the 300 AD era, there's a couple church fathers that noted that all of the Christians, when they saw this, they remembered. And there was actually a moment in time when the Roman army kind of dispersed just a little bit and gave them a gateway and all the Christians left just as Jesus told them to. And then a short period of time later, the Roman army would besiege the nation or the city and the temple. Some historians estimate upwards around a million people were killed in this siege of Jerusalem. Another almost 100,000 were led off to slavery and the rest of Israel was dispersed among the nations. He said, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. And the Christians didn't. They heeded his warning. And there's a little bit of debate on why, but there is no mention of the Christians dying there. Some people believe it because guys like Josephus kind of classified the Jews and the Christians all as the same. Um, I disagree, but it could be. It could be. So they heeded Jesus' warning and they fled, but the nation of Israel as a nation was being judged and they did not heed the warning. Now we know from Matthew and, and Mark that this is a picture, this is something that's going to happen very similar in the Great Tribulation right in the middle when as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the man of sin will be revealed. Jesus said just as Daniel the prophet had foretold, the abomination that makes desolate, will stand in the holy place and declare that he is God. And so we know that the Antichrist will come and do so, and that there will be soon a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Um, and each, each passing year, they get a little bit closer to actually making it happen. So these things are coming, and we are supposed to learn from the, the past here. Jesus sets up one fulfilled prophecy so that our or a coming generation would understand what was going on. It's a sign, and Jesus says, respond. And so, as we continue on in this chapter, he's going to give us signs, and there will be an expected response. And it's interesting to me that we're going to see kind of a theme coming on in here for those who dwell upon the earth. That there's an escape, but for those who dwell upon the earth. And that there will be this idea of the, the coming judgment, just like with Jerusalem, but there will be a way to escape it. And it really just blessed me as I read this and remembered and looked at you know, how, how much Luke focused on, on the Gentiles. That here he really doesn't dive in so much to the tribulation as the other writers, but really speaks on 
the fact that here's the reality of God and there's a way to escape the judgment, the vengeance to come. Verse 22. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be laid away, led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so this did, literally for the Jewish nation in 70 AD, as we talked about a little bit last week, literally came to pass. And we know from the rest of the scriptures that it gives us insight that this happened, and Jesus said, if this happens, so will the next. It is a for sure prophecy, and we have, we have history to know. And it's interesting as we continue on down the road in our own nation. We have, we have sayings like, you know, those, those who ignore history are, down, are bound to repeat it. Or those who don't learn from it are going to go down the exact same road. Or I can't remember the, the saying, sorry. We'll just stick with those who ignore history are bound to repeat it. If we ignore this section of both prophecy and history... There's a warning for our time, for the time that is preceding the coming of the Lord, that it could also be repeated by us. That we could ignore a clear, hey, when you see this happening, get ready. And so we have the testimony of history, we have the testimony of prophecy reminding us of this. Now Jesus says, you know, be care, you know, woe to those who are pregnant and nursing. There's a woe for that in the tribulation as well, as well. Because we have an absolute responsibility that when God says something, to respond. And it doesn't matter if you're tall or you're short or you're pregnant or you're handicapped or what have you. You are to respond and to obey the command of God to the best of your ability. Now make no mistake... The Lord has not lost anyone who loved him yet. Draw near to him, love him, give him your life. It's going to be all right, but make no mistake. If you think that, well, I'll get around to this Jesus thing or this Christian thing later, it's going to be all right, whatever. God and I, we're, we're doing okay, but you're really not. There is a warning and there is a time when it's going to describe it as a snare, a trap and it will get you. But those who in Christ, there is an escape. And so, we see the horrors and the terrors that came upon them. You can read about it in your history books of what occurred and had Jesus prophesied what would happen. But he says something else that until the Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles and until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So, there's a few things that are specifically mentioned about the Gentiles. A couple of them in Romans 11. One, it speaks of the riches of the Gentiles. In Romans 11, verse 12. And that is basically just the blessings that we enjoy in Christ since we've been grafted in. That, the, that there are the blessings that have been given to the Gentiles. One that I really like that goes along with that is Colossians chapter 1 verse 27, because it speaks about the, the glories and the riches of this mystery that was kept from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's something that we have been blessed with, unique to our time. It's been given also to the Gentiles who've been grafted into the blessings of Abraham. Also, there's something referred to as the fullness of, of the Gentiles, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, until God has gathered together his Gentile bride and calls him home. Which seems to, be, seems to happen about the same time as when the times of the Gentiles are complete. Which is essentially the time when the Gentile nations are 
really kind of up and up and going and running the world and and Israel doesn't have control over Jerusalem. So as we kind of look at this, for myself personally, I go back and forth on it just a little bit. Some will make a really good case that the time of the Gentiles ends, that, that this major sign for Jesus coming back and the times being fulfilled is when Israel got um, Jerusalem back in the Six-Day War in 1967. That that was the point when it really became a nation and the times of the Gentiles were complete and we were just waiting for that last time before we go home and the tribulation begins. Um, I don't know. It could be. Uh, I think it's very well possible, and I leave room in my own personal belief, that it may be tied to also having full control of the Temple Mount. And until they have that along with Jerusalem and able to to worship that, that possibly it hasn't come to its completion. Pay your nickel, make your choice. It's each time we see Jerusalem and Israel gain a little ground, know that it's not going backwards. The clock's ticking, and the time either is up or is almost up. Um, but we'll see. That's one thing about the future, is it always comes to pass. So read your Bible. And as Jesus is going to say, look up, because these things are coming soon. Coming soon to a church near you, hopefully. <laughs> so, verse 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, and the sea and the waves roaring, Men's, men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. God has given us the amazing opportunity not to be asleep when these things happen. There is a time that he spoke of in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, that's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jesus said, when these things begin to happen, lift up your heads. Look up. Your redemption is drawing near. And just like the, the armies surrounding Rome... Just as Titus coming to besiege Jerusalem, so obvious will also be the signs. There won't be any doubt soon. There won't be any more argument over which left behind book or what series is right or wrong. We will know. There won't be any question if Jerusalem is being besieged. There won't be any question if the Lord is at the door. We'll know. And Jesus says, look up. And there will be signs unusual things going on in the heavens. And a lot of people have taken some time to try to think out or express what this is. And again, um, I'm not going to go too far down that road because um, some things we just don't really know. But you will. Uh, when the sun and the moon go out, you won't miss that. Or something else happens, uh, you won't miss it. It won't be a, a blood moon. It will be a moon that really looks like blood. There won't be it won't be any questions. And Christians are to get ready as they see these things begin to come together. As we see the distress among the nations and the perplexities. This whole idea of the distress and perplexities is like this quagmire, quicksand type of thing. That, that our, our world is going to get so complex. The issues, the, the latest virus or bacteria that is immune to whatever we have, the latest person who's about to get a nuclear bomb, the latest whatever, is going to get so complex that people just, that we just don't even know what to do anymore. That's, that is the direction that Jesus said the world will be taking. And it's going to get so intense that it seems that it may result in sometimes even heart failure. It's going to actually be 
It's going to be something unlike the world has ever seen. But does that mean the world, those who dwell on the earth, will repent? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. I want to take a look a little bit at the importance of the situation now. Chapter 9, verse 20 and 21 of Revelation. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So if you back up there on your own time in verse 18... It says a third of mankind was killed. And they wouldn't repent. They won't repent. Turn with me all to chapter 16 of Revelation. We'll read verse 9 through 11. Revelation 16, 9 through 11. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl, and on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Just like when the armies were invading Jerusalem, if they had not obeyed Jesus and they had not given their life to him, when they saw Titus going in, they were simply going to go in and help out and have judgment fall on them. See, the Lord makes it clear in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I'm pretty sure, that he gives this illustration of Lot. And how when judgment was going to come on Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Lord pulled him out just in time before judgment. And then Peter says this specific interesting thing. He says, because the Lord knows how to deliver the righteous and to reserve the ungodly for judgment. And we have this tremendous opportunity of grace and hope and love. Even though the Lord tarrying right now is kind of a trial for the church, it means that there is still hope for the lost. And we have to get the word out and we have to share the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ because later it's not going to work out. It doesn't mean you can just come to him as you will later. Repentance is of God. When we read that verse, you know, that God might grant them repentance. Speaking of those who we go to to share encouragement to turn from sin. You don't get to just dictate to the Lord how it's going to work out in the future. He says, here's the future. You should be wise. This is exactly how it happened in the past. I'm giving you warning ahead of time so that you can respond ahead of time to be ready because if you wait until Jerusalem surrounded, so to speak, if you wait until, oh my goodness, this is what they've been talking about, it very well may be too late. It doesn't mean that you'll repent then. You may just blaspheme God. Why'd you stick me in the middle of this mess? How can you do this to the world? I thought you were a God of love. And he is, and he holds out his grace and his mercy today that you can be right with him. So in this, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Perhaps things as far as the earth very well could be moved on its axis. There could be um, a tweaking of the orbiting of the heavenly bodies, the planets. We, you know, we don't really know for absolute certain. Luke doesn't spend a whole lot of time on it, so I won't either. But we know that the powers of the heavens, the moon and the stars and the earth, will have specific signs. And so will the sun. You won't miss it. When you see these things begin to happen, look up. So, we have in our news, and I loved what uh, 
Mike McIntosh shared when he was up here. He said, you know, have you ever noticed in the news lately, everything is unprecedented, never happened before, or my personal favorite, of biblical proportions. <laughs> well, pretty soon that'll actually be true, rather than just media hype. Hype. Because as Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 says, the return of the Lord, when he comes, it's going to be awesome. When he comes, it is going to be awesome. Jude chapter 14 and 15 says that he's coming back, and it says ten ten thousands of his saints, if you're reading a King James, New King James. But the idea is, is an unnumerable host of his saints are coming with him. And I believe that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 gives us an insight of that where it speaks of all the saints who had given their testimony of faith. They were a cloud of witnesses. And when he comes with the cloud of heavens, I believe that that's referring to coming with his great cloud of witnesses, his, his innumerable saints to establish the kingdom. And it shall not be undone. So we have a, a shadow that's cast forth and we know that the substance is coming, drawing near. And it will be as obvious as Titus surrounding Jerusalem. And Luke says, pay attention, Gentiles. Verse 29, Then he spoke to them in a parable, Look at the tree, and all the trees, when they are already budding, you see and know yourselves that summer is now near. So Jesus here takes a specific tree that buds before summer, and he says, take a look at this parable. I'm setting a, a truth so that you can understand something that you can't see. That just like the fig tree, which oftentimes represents Israel, but Luke throws in all the other nations, the Gentile nations as well. When you see them budding, know that summer is near. Know that the coming of the Son of Man is near. And this too is a little bit difficult to understand what exactly the budding of the nations is. So I'll give you my best understanding. It seems to be a revived, if you want to call it a neo-nationalism, a revived nationalism among the nations. Just as Israel bud as into a nation and rise, rose up on the world scene, it seems that there will also be a striving for power and being a world force among the nations. Now, I know that there will be a one world government, but it will also be shared among ten powers that hold, hold their own. And I read a number of, of articles that recently really went into, and they were talking about this phenomenon that really has been begun to occur since the election of Trump, but also along with the Brexit, that there is this revived interest in being your own nation, your own power. The North Koreas who want to get a nuclear bomb so that they can be a world player. Or an Iran. Or so on and so forth. That that very well me may be what leads to even more wars and rumors of wars as we fight for our own nationalism um, before going into what will eventually be a confederation of nations head by, headed up by the Antichrist. Could that be off? Sure. Because Jesus said that when you see them bud, he doesn't say when you say, see nationalism rise. But again, um, here, you know, take, pay your nickel, make your choice. But that is, a, that is a good possibility of the way we may see it as something that we can know that summer is near. This rise of nationalism it's interesting to me that uh, when Israel really stepped onto the world scene in 1967, it was about the time that, uh, that they themselves had developed their first nuclear weapon and began to mass produce them after the war, the Six Day War, and said, hey, if anybody tries to take us out again, we'll start a nuclear war and all your oil goes bye bye. And so everybody began to pay attention because we became dependent upon oil. And many new nations are trying to rise up and follow a similar pattern that if we just get a nuclear weapon, then the world has to listen. Um, I don't know. Interesting. 
It'll be interesting. Verse 31. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. The surety of the word of God, his word is a hammer, it is a fire, and it is more sure than the length of the earth and the sun. Which also means, you know, the earth isn't going to be reconstructed. It will pass away, but the word of God will not. So these things will play, take place. And it says this generation will not pass away. There's a few different thoughts on that. One is that the kingdom came in and that all these things were fulfilled by 70 AD. In which you get um, that revelation and its prophecies were fulfilled within that generation's lifetime. And there's some... Um, History that is used by, given by Josephus and others that really, they believe that Nero fulfilled the role of the Antichrist and so on and so forth. Um, one for me that is, there's a couple things that are a killer for that, for um, believing that this has already come to pass. So one, uh, Jesus didn't come in great power and great glory in 70 AD. Didn't happen. Two, revelation by all by the majority of the best evidence, was written in the 90s AD. And he said specifically it's prophecy. First and second John were written in the 80s AD after 70 AD, and they still said Antichrist will come. Um, so based on some of that evidence and a number of other scriptures, I believe that he was not referring to the generation that he was personally speaking to during that time. So the second thought is, well, it's the generation that begins to see these signs. They won't pass away until all these things come to pass. That's very well, maybe. I know that um, the ones who see all the signs certainly won't. And then the final and third thought is, generation can also be translated as race, and that Israel would not be completely destroyed before God fulfilled his promises. That that generation, that race, if you will, that he was speaking of, wouldn't wouldn't be destroyed before it came to pass. Um, again, I believe it's the generation that will see these things come to pass. The church certainly had that expectation in First and Second Thessalonians that they would see it all come to pass. And by the way, for a special treat this summer, um, Mike Ruffner is going to take time and teach through those on Wednesday night. It's going to be, it's going to be good. So we'll, we'll give you a heads up when he's going to teach you First and Second Thessalonians coming up this summer. Verse 34, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come to pass as a snare on those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So beware, take, take heed. First he starts off with no, and now he says, watch. Don't be weighed down. The Bible constantly gives us this exhortation to walk in the Spirit, be led by the Holy Spirit, be empowered and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, and don't be weighed down by the things of the flesh and of the world. Carousing is the, basically, it's like basically being hung over. Don't be in a, a stupor because of your lifestyle. Drunkenness and the cares of this life. If you're not in Christ and you want to say, well, I'll get to that later, I'll keep an eye out, but I'm going to go live my life. Jesus said, it's going to come on you like a, like a trap. You're going to be enticed by those things. And you're going to go over there, and the snare is going to drop. And like a bird or whatever they were trying to catch at the time, you'll be caught in the snare. And it's going to come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. So praise the Lord, we won't be dwelling on the face of the earth. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but that's a reality. He says, watch, don't get caught up in that. There's going to be a trap for those who don't want to abide in Christ, but to do their, all, their own thing. And it's a warning for all, nations, all ages and generations, really. Um, so watch. Watch. Verse 36, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things 
that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. They would be able to stand. Now we know that to stand before the Son of Man is not based upon our own strength, not based upon our own wisdom. We aren't counted worthy of ourselves. But that one work that we can do, and God says that work is believing in the Son, that we may be counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man when He comes. Don't take foolish risks with your soul. And as I was praying over this, the Lord reminded me of a, a gentleman that I, work, that I worked with. Because the whole idea of this is kind of like, it's not just stand still and watch the news when you're watching. But it's be alert, be awake. As you're going through the motions of, of the life that God has called to you, don't do it um, in a, in a stupor with, the, with your headlights off, if you will but to do it while you're awake. Pay attention and know that there are dangers out there. And so, um, a gentleman I worked with, he was married to my cousin for quite a while. And uh, man, just a hardworking guy. Really enjoyed working with him. And uh, he'd worked for uh, the mill that uh, I worked at for a number of years. And, you know, he was, he was, you know, just old school guy. If something needed to get taken care of, and it obviously was kind of ridiculous, you know, a little over the top on safety, he'd just go get it done so that we can get the product out and make the company some money because that's what we were paid there to do. Um, but oftentimes, when you get in the habit of ignoring warnings or things that are given for your safety, sometimes we take it a step too far. And uh, so he was loading the press with um, plywood, getting ready to get pressed um, a couple months ago, a month ago. And uh, something that he'd done a hundred times that you weren't really supposed to do, but it's what needed to get done. He'd jump up there and clean off the piece so that it didn't damage the plywood. And, uh, and he jumped up there one time and his foot happened to kick the sensor and the uh, plywood came up and, and crushed him between the machine. And in that moment of just getting in the habit of just fixing things, being distracted by not necessarily the things that he was supposed to do in a way that he wasn't supposed to do it, it uh, cost him his life. Uh, cost somebody a husband, a father, because he didn't look at the warning signs. He didn't take the, the heed for safety. And that's how fast and in that moment the snare will drop on those who dwell on the face of the earth and those who are not in Christ. Something you've done a hundred times. My, my one beer has now turned into six. I'll, you know, I'll get it straightened out later. My PG shows are now rated mature. But I'll, you know, I'll get that stuff straightened out later. But one day, that safe, that thing that you've got away with a hundred times may fail. The time may be up. And the Lord says, don't live your life like that, counting on the grace, counting on that one switch or that thing that's been working to hold out on you. Because it might not. And if you don't follow the warning, if you don't look at the safety procedures, if you want to do things your own way, it might get you. So he gives us this warning to pay attention beforehand. Look at the signs, and just as is obvious as it was with Jerusalem being surrounded, know that the Son of Man will be, when He comes, it will be the same way. There will be, the fig trees will be budding, the nations will be obviously in the place where God has wanted them, and you're to look up, because your redemption draws near. So I want to kind of look at a few verses before we close on that. And again, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 through 11 gives that description of how God knows how to deliver the righteous and to keep the unrighteous for the day of judgment. They're using Lot as an example. But I want to look at Revelation 3.10 first. Revelation 3.10. <clears throat> 
because there's some interesting wording that Luke has been using, and Jesus uses it too, writing to the church of Philadelphia, to this church that has this open door before them, an opportunity to serve God and to do what they can for him now. Revelation 3.10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The earth dwellers. And there's a promise that just as, hey, if you pay attention when Titus surrounds Jerusalem, if you look for the way escape, you'll make it. When you see wars and nations and distresses and perplexities and the fig tree and the nations begin to bud, look for it. There's a, there's a deliverance coming, but not for those who dwell on the face of the earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16, or excuse me, verse 51 through 54, speaks of that we are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye in a moment when the trumpet sounds. And I loved what one guy said. He said, you know, I'm not so much looking for, si for signs, but I'm listening for the sound, the trumpet sound. So I want to close with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll begin in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in 16. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. The Spirit of God has told us that we can comfort one another with the fact that those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord that comes at any moment when the world does not expect it, we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And there will be a difference between those who are with the Lord in the air, those who are, will be coming back with Him, and those who dwell upon the face of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ, when the, Gentile, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, will take His bride home. And Jesus said, that day is coming in a day that you don't expect. So I hope you guys aren't expecting that today. Amen. <laughs> he says, comfort one another with these words. As we look at these difficult times and the, the history that came upon Jerusalem and the things that are coming for his coming, Jesus said, this is a joyous time for you because I'm coming to get you. And we're going to have a heavenly party. And you're going to come back with me in glory. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we also will appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3. Comfort one another with these words. When the world is rising up to its power and a one world leader is getting ready to come onto the scene and it says peace and safety, the Lord says, <laughs> keep one eye on the sky and an ear listening for the trumpet because we're going home. And, be that, and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass because God did not appoint us to wrath. And we know that our worthiness comes from Jesus Christ alone and our faith in Him. So don't count on tomorrow, guys. Take a look at the, the warnings. Take a look at the world. Because if you were to chart all of these things, you would see that, you know, like on math, putting, putting your little chart, the trajectory of the world is all headed in this direction at a rapid rate. The trajectory of the church is rapidly heading towards a great falling away. The trajectory of the world is going towards a one-world government. The trajectory of the world is going towards a one-world currency. It's going towards a war that's described in Ezekiel chapter 38 that will immediately precede these things. 
It's all coming there. And occasionally we have contractions, like that pregnant woman example, and, and everybody gets rapturitis and somebody will predict a date or something. So don't get distracted by those things. But pay attention to the signs. We are not to be asleep and it won't overtake us. And we, uh, more than all, should be a joyous people because as the world is falling apart, we see it falling together and we can have hope for redemption to where those who dwell on the face of the earth, their hearts are going to fail them. They'll be at one point gnawing their own tongues, hoping for death. Let's share the good news with them that we're not appointed to wrath, that we who are alive are looking for man that hope. Enjoy the sunshine today. May God richly bless you guys as we wait for, as we wait to go home. Well, Father, we thank you for this morning. What a beautiful and glorious day. We wait for that any moment, Lord, when you can come for us. And we wait, Lord. We know that that day, that moment, won't overtake us like a thief, Lord. That we won't be among the earth dwellers. We'll be with our Lord in heaven. So God, as we wait for that day, may our faith be strengthened. As we look back and we see your prophecies exactly fulfilled in history, we know that they will be exactly fulfilled soon. Lord, may your name be lifted high. May we be a joyous people as we wait, as we long for our Savior, who will transform our lowly bodies to, into likeness of his glorious body. What a wonderful day that would be. No more sickness, no more pain. No more death. God, and it will all come down in a twinkling of an eye. Lord, may you be blessed with our life and may we abide in you. In Jesus' name.